All right, Obo Jazz, woo! All right, so uh, the other thing is I'm extremely jet lagged uh, still after being here for like four days. So um, yeah, we have, we have to get like, we have to get excited and, and it's, it's security and I know it's really exciting. Actually, it's really, it can be really boring and dry. So I'm gonna try to make it exciting and uh, get animated. I really hope that this tether that I have on me uh, doesn't stop me from like like moving, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll be fine. Um, so uh, for those of you, uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about node security. Uh, I'm Adam Baldwin. I'm not the actor Adam Baldwin. Uh, did not star in Firefly or Chuck. You can find me at uh, Adam Baldwin on the internet uh, or Twitter, that's the internet, I guess too. Uh, and GitHub, uh, Evil Packet, uh, where there's some like crappy code there. Uh, I work at a place called And Yet with, uh, with uh, David and, and an amazing team of people uh, that we, we build software. We build uh, stuff with Node. Who else builds stuff with Node here? Please, lots of hands, because then this won't get awkward. OK. Um, and uh, so we, we, we build web software uh, and cool stuff. On the other side of the house, which is, which is the, the, the side that is um, where I focus most of my attention on, is uh, the Lyft security side. That's David as well, right there. Uh, we, climbed a, we climbed a big hill to, uh, together to take a picture, silly selfie. And uh, we, we, on the other side, we, we, we break software, right? So I get, uh, I get the privilege of uh, looking at a lot of developers' code and a lot of Node projects and a lot of other uh, platform projects uh, and pointing out flaws in those and finding flaws in those. Um, and it's, just, it's, it's my passion sort of like, like pointing out all this stuff and finding this stuff. Uh, about three years ago, I started a project called the, the Node Security Project. Has anyone uh, seen anything? Uh, about the Node Security Project, a few people? Cool, awesome, yay. Uh, that's good, because we're gonna talk a, a bunch about that um, towards the end, um, and sort of uh, talk about uh, uh, some of the goals. Uh, well, I'll do that now. Uh, we'll talk about the goals of the project. So I started this to uh, basically evangelize security within uh, the Node community. Uh, the, the problems that I'm gonna talk about today have existed for, uh, since the dawn of time, right? Like like. These, these problems with related to security are not new to the Node community, new to JavaScript. Uh, they've existed uh, back you know, in the C days, back in uh, the Perl days uh, with uh, uh, CPAN, with uh, Python and PIP and uh, Ruby and RubyGems. These, these, these problems are prolific across all of these pro platforms. And so um, I, I wanted to change the perspective when it came to Node. I was like, all right, damn it, this is enough. Um, we're, we're, we're going to change it and we're going to, tr we're going to try something new. The node security project is basically, uh, I'm a hacker and I like to try experiments. And so that's what this is. This is, this is an experiment, uh, on the community. Uh, I'm sorry, you've all been a part of an experiment. Um, so, uh, today, uh, that's not there. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to, uh, since I like to evangelize, uh, security topics and I don't, uh, I don't often talk about this, uh, in depth. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to do a review of the OS Top 10. Uh, who has heard of the OS Top 10? That's more hands than I normally see, which is good. Um, so for you, this is going to be a, a very quick review, but I'm going to try to give my spin on it, the patterns that we see auditing Node apps um, when it comes to the OS Top 10. Uh, during, the, dur during that, we're also going to get sort of like a little like peek at the Node Security Project tools, things that can help you uh, utilize the Node Security Project. Uh, as well as, uh, and then at the end, we're going to talk about this, the, the really fun stuff, the stuff that I'm really excited about, and that's security in the Node ecosystem, um, and uh, sort of what we're doing with the Node Security Project uh, the, most recently. Uh, so uh, without further ado, the OWASP Top 10, and uh, review for like 12 people in the room. So uh, the first one, uh, so the OWASP Top 10 is a set of common flaws, like the most common flaws that, uh, that exists in, in, in applications, and in web applications. And uh, we see them all the time. They're, they're, it's by far not the, like the, the entirety of the security problems you're gonna see in an application. But if you target understanding the OAuth top 10, you're going to, you're going to have, a, a, I guess, a better time with application security. Um, you're, gonna find, you're gonna find flaws and, and you're gonna have a, a more secure app. So the first one is injection, and this, this, this actually has to do with uh, SQL injection, no SQL injection, um, like OS command injection, where, where you're able to get, take data from a data source, uh, data input, 
uh, put it into your application and it, and it ends up um, injecting into some other subsystem. And that's a, that's a secret right there, the sort of dirty little secret of the penetration uh, testing community is that, that that's really all we do as, uh, as, as, at Lyft. We, we find data uh, sources, uh, we look for data sinks, and we see where the data traverses. And this is, this is, a, big, this is a big area, and this is why it's the number one on the OS top 10, is that, is that when these actually exist in an application, they are extremely, um, uh, uh, like, they have, they have large impact. And so uh, one of the ones that, I, that we've been seeing lately uh, is with Express and Mongo. And specifically, like we see that combination a lot. We see Express apps, Mongo apps, data flowing from one to the other. And so uh, and we see this particular assumption being made. So when this happens, qs.parse, uh, foobar baz, uh, what, what, what would you expect it to produce? If you know the actual answer. Is it, is it going to just produce a string? Is it going to produce, like, what, what would be the result, right? So it's, you're going to get an object back that's going to look like this. But most of the time we want, we want like, value uh, or, or key value, right? Just like, just like David was talking about, key and value, that's typically what we want. But QS, like, so, and that's only because, um, because of this, this, this structure here. Um, and so normally you take, you might say if we have, uh, say something like uh, a Mongo database and we, uh, we parse something like, like this where you've got an ID and you've got a, a, a not in and you've got a, a value, you can, you can create a really complex object with your URL query string and that ends up in your Mongo database. So if you put this in a find query for say uh, authentication or, or something like that to, to retrieve data from a database, you're going to end up with, uh, you can do really complex queries, say that you end up with a regex query or something like that, uh, and you might, might be able to pull out data that, that you shouldn't have access to or something like that. So that's, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I'm going to go really, really fast. So if you're interested in any of this, you can go to OAuth.org and get um, more in-depth information regarding each one of these. Uh, the second one is broken authentication and session management, um, which basically has to do with things like uh, not properly hashed passwords, because um, uh, everyone stores passwords in clear text, right? Like that's a thing. <laughs> we actually see that on tests. People laugh, and developers do that. So if you're doing that and you know about it, don't laugh. Change it because we see it. Like I, I hate to like be, sound like I'm shaming, but uh, we we see it. We actually do see it. Um, and and this is part partly too about. Um, uh, protecting things like session identifiers, uh, session identifiers, so cookies that deal with sessions, and uh, things like HTTP only flags on cookies. So an HTTP flag on a cookie basically says that the JavaScript on the front end, the JavaScript that you want to write, can't consume that cookie, uh, can't actually have access to the cookie and just able to send it. So uh, as well as SSL for data in transit, uh, which is which is this particular category. So moving on, um, cross-site scripting. Um, I would. Probably everyone knows what that is, right? Number three, cross-site scripting. Uh, super, uh, super prevalent in web applications. Uh, we're, we're definitely seeing it less in the, in the apps that we audit because of frameworks, because of templating languages that actually, uh, actually give good defaults. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is sort of a, a table of uh, escaped values and unescaped values. And uh, you can do yourself a, a favor when you're audit or when you're when you're writing an application. If you search for any, any one of these sort of, uh, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but you've got like there's only little values that differ between an escaped and an unescaped. And you have an, like an insecure situation here potentially. Um, and if you just search for these patterns, if you search for triple triple uh, triple uh, mustaches, if you're using mustache conveniently, uh, curly brackets, whatever, um, just grep across your entire code base. You're going to see all the instances you're using that, and potentially you've got an injection point. Um, for those who aren't familiar with cross-site scripting, cross-site scripting is when you take user input, uh, and it is basically reflected back out from a stored, from stored from the database or from the query parameters in the in the URL, put back into the browser, and that that then is rendered in the DOM instead of displayed. So uh, a script uh, a script tag might uh, 
uh, might execute. And then, and then uh, it's basically the same as if I gave you a, code, uh, a piece of code to run, uh, as, as David's example, a floppy disk, which we use anymore. Uh, if a USB stick and you, you, you just run an executable, it's code execution in your browser, which the browser is the operating system. Um, there's a couple other instances that are really interesting. Mustache with register helper. Uh, safe makes strings uh, basically safe by default, so so that's an injection point as well as handlebar safe string. Any of the, any of you using Ember and Ember uh, helpers um, that may use uh, safe string, it may it, you may have to escape that that data by default afterwards. So um, going way too slow. So insecure direct object references, um, something that we see here. Uh, basically, this is where a uh, developer exposes a reference, uh, like, a, like a URL or something like that. And um, basically, uh, you can access it um, uh, just by changing an ID or changing a value, right? You can just you can flip that reference and just tick, tick, tick and, and, walk, and walk through them. Um, and that's, that's basically it. You always have to check and validate um, that... Uh, somebody actually has access to that resource before you before you render it back out. It would be something like this: just saying, uh, send back the data when we find it with just whatever ID was in there. We didn't actually we didn't actually check there was authorization there. Uh, we see this quite a bit, um, and we see this stuff protected instead of instead of good authorization code. We see it ended up being protected by um, by say just uh, random uh, values. And those random values, then uh, instead, what we what we do then is we we go you go back to the first slide where we can create complex queries out of the query string, and we end up getting around that the fact that we can't guess that value. So it's it's useful. Um, same thing with like just reading something off of disk uh, and just sending it back to the user. You can have a directory traversal where you just dot dot slash dot dot slash move yourself way out of the root where you're you're reading um, files and, and display it back to the user. Um, so that's that. Security misconfiguration. This is basically just like, this is OWASP. Like we're just going to dump a bunch of crap in a, in a category, uh, which is just it, com it comes down to the insecure defaults, uh, and which which the most useful piece out of this that I can tell you about is uh, security headers. There's a bunch of security headers you can put in a web application. Um, if you're using Express, you can use Luska from PayPal or Helmet to just add these security headers really simply. Uh, if you're using Happy, it's actually built in by default, and you just so you set security yes, and you get uh, I think all of these but content security policy. And I'm not going to go into content security policy, but uh, if you're building web applications, go learn what that is and implement it because I think it's uh, it's a great set of defaults for combating cross-site scripting type vulnerabilities. Sensitive data exposure, uh, again, uh, security is most, uh, security when it comes down to this is, is usually about security of data in transit, uh, in use, and at rest. So in transit, SSL, right? At rest, um, we want to make sure we've hashed passwords in a, in a secure way. Uh, the, current, the current trend is to use bcrypt uh, or uh, scrypt, um, depending on what type of attack you're, preventing, or you're, you're trying to um, uh, protect against. And um, the other thing we see a lot of is just uh, like YOLO logging um, console, console log request.payload and just like just storing it somewhere and doing this in production and uh, you know, on, on, on forms that take credit cards uh, or other sensitive information. And uh, that ends up putting that data in some just log file that gets stuck someplace that we can have access to then uh, if we happen to get into a logging machine or something like that. Uh, missing functional level access control. This gets confused with direct object reference a lot, and it's it's related. Uh, where this has to do with authorization as well. Um, basically, uh, it has to do with uh, checking permissions before you give somebody access to something. Again, uh, it, I feel it's it's basically the same. There's some nuances between the two. I'm not going to explain it because I think it's the same as the other one. Uh, cross site request forgery. We see a ton of. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go into detail on this one because it is so impacting. Um, Cross-site request forgery, um, I didn't do really complex slides, which I could have, but all of this stuff has way better explanations than I can give you in a very, very short time. Cross-site uh, cross request forgery uh, exists when you, uh, okay, back up. So imagine you, uh, you're submitting a form to change uh, your profile. And it's just a simple web form. And when you, when you submit that form, you, you change your email, 
and you submit it and it goes, it sends a post request to some URL, right? And then your email's changed. Uh, as an attacker, when you visit, say, evil.com, and I, have, I can have that same form existing without being visual, and I can, I can submit that automatically with JavaScript, and then I can change your email address. And so there's only really one way of preventing that, and that's, that's where you include a, a secret token uh, on render. So when I render it on uh, example.com, I put, uh, the server's gonna put a token in there. Evil.com's not gonna, and, and check that server side when it's submitted. Evil.com's not gonna know what that token is. Um, a lot of apps get their, their sort of, their get saved um, by using, they, they use, uh, you know, the separation of an API and a rendered application where you're using something like uh, a bearer token to do authentication um, when you have to send those to the API. If you're doing that through a header, it's only allowed on that domain. You've basically, you've kind of killed two birds with one stone because uh, an, a remote attacker won't have that value and it won't get submitted to that API. The one place that we see this really, really missed is with WebSockets. With when you build a, a socket IO connection to another server and you end up doing authentication using cookies. And um, that's, that's the secret sauce of, of, of why CSRF works is because the browser says, oh, you'd like to send a request to this other domain that you already have authentication credentials for. And it just sends those cookies along for you. Oh, we'll just tack these cookies on it and it goes with. Socket.io's uh, built-in data authorization uh, handling basically takes, um, uses, uses cookies. And so if you don't actually send uh, uh, some type of token over the pipe, uh, or you don't put it in the query string or something. Um, and if you put it in the query string, then you end up with the sensitive data exposure problem, so they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but if you don't send something over the pipe, you end up with a, a CSRF type issue as well uh, with WebSockets. And that, we see that actually uh, more than traditional because of the new APIs, um, uh, the style with APIs. Uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. So now we kind of get into uh, a little bit of where the Node Security Project comes in for Node applications, uh, and this is this is this is more fun stuff uh, than listening to me babble about other stuff. So uh, we've got we've got a tool called um, NSP that we publish. So you can uh, basically do um, those slides came out wrong. Uh, you can basically do uh, npmi g NSP, and uh, that gives you a binary that you can run, so you can run uh, basically NSP package or NSP shrink wrap, depending on if you use shrink wrap files or package files. And what that does is it actually gives you um, output that looks like this. It queries, it basically recursively goes down your entire dependency tree and looks at every single dependency and compares that against our database of known vulnerabilities and says, is this basically, uh, is this a vulnerable package to something that's known? Um, and it doesn't mean that your, your project is necessarily exploitable, but it's, it's, you know, why not just bother to upgrade if you know about it? So this particular said that the, the, the QS package uh, in request 236 is, is, is vulnerable and it's patched in this one. So probably you should upgrade your request or you should complain to Michael that, you know, he's using a version that's, that's vulnerable. Um, doesn't really mean, uh, again, that you're exploitable. So I'm gonna go back to this slide here and talk about require safe for just a minute. Um, basically, require safe is um, this is why this is why I didn't really want to talk about it in in, in depth is because it would have just ended up being a product pitch. Um, it's basically Lyft's um, enterprise version of the Node Security Project. So when I said that I, when I started the Node Security Project, I wanted to sort of um, uh, sort of a, a, a ocean boiling uh, endeavor, right? We wanted to we change the perception of security in the community. And it turns out that that's a really hard problem and that it's a full-time job. We said when we started that we were going to audit all the modules in NPM. There's 18,000 modules when we started the project. There's over 125,000 modules now. And that's just an insane uh, task for a small group of four people uh, that sort of like work on it to, to actually accomplish. So what we, basically what we need to do is we need to make uh, this project our full-time job. And to do that, we need funding. Therefore, we need to basically... Uh, trick enterprises or uh, businesses into funding the Node Security Project by buying a product that's useful for them. So it, it's just the, the, the whole thing there is it's intentful uh, auditing of, of your dependency tree, which I'll get into a little bit later uh, when I talk about dependency graphs with uh, NPM. So that's, that's no more salesy pitch. Uh, uh, sorry, 
Um, so the other thing I want to talk about, another tool that's really useful if you do a lot of front-end development is uh, a tool called Retire. Same thing, we didn't do it, we didn't build it. Um, a guy, uh, his Twitter handle's Webtonal. Uh, I think his name's, um, I can't pronounce it. Um, he's, he, did, he wrote Retire, and it actually uses the Node Security Project data as well, uh, but it also does something else that's cool, and it, it looks at your, um, your dependencies like jQuery and Angular and all those other like front end libraries to see if they've got known vulnerabilities and it, and it can tell you it can give you a very similar similar view like um, you know the I can't has uh, I can't has bars whatever uh, jQuery was uh, had known vulnerabilities and it gives you like some references for you to read about it uh, but really just go update your update your dependency um, dependencies we did something interesting with uh, retire and we ran it against the entire Bower because uh, Bower's like, you know, it's a lot of front ends. So we, ran, we ran it against uh, a Bower and basically uh, found just a ton of data and that, a ton so much that it would be rather difficult to uh, communicate with all, with all the people. So we basically, we wrote about it, uh, we sort of evangelized about it, and we uh, put the data up there so that everyone could have that uh, and so basically look up if, if they've got um, something that's vulnerable uh, just to sort of talk about that. So um, that's that. Uh, last one is uh, unvalidated redirects and forwards. And uh, so web applications typically like redirect. You, uh, you, you go to hit a URL, you're not authenticated, so it redirects you to the login form and says, says uh, hey, uh, log in and then we'll return you to your old place. A common method to do that is just to put something like a return to URL in the query string or something like that. We see that all the time. Um, it's useful in phishing attacks where I might send you a URL uh, that with a, re, uh, a redirect to to my domain. Um, it it might be it, it might be useful. Uh, again, it's it's a, a, a low impact vulnerability typically, uh, but it's it's part of the OS top ten. So that is the OS top, OS top ten in a nutshell. Um, I'm sure somebody else could explain it a lot better, but that's that's a great place to start when you're talking security of of web applications, node applications. So let's talk about uh, some, some just things. It says I've got like three minutes left, but we'll probably go over just a couple. Um, basically, this is, this is a question that's been on my mind, uh, and it's sort of the premise behind the Node Security Project and how we got started with that, as well as Require Safe. And it's, it's whose code are you actually running in production? And when you talk about Node, the, 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 the Node way is to build tiny modules uh, and that do one thing and do one thing really well, and we share all that code. So you know you can build something off of, of you know David's WebRTC Explorer and build on top of that and not have to do all the work that he did. And you can you can we we can use it as stepping stones. Um, however, you end up with an interesting problem when you come to security, and that is trust. Do I trust all of you to ship code into production for me? Right? You've got your team there and you've got all the other people but you might have one bad actor and not somebody that's necessarily um intentionally writing bad code but they just might they just might produce the shitty module and it does the thing that you want it to do but it does so in it that has a vulnerability in it unless you go look at your dependency tree um and you actually audit all those modules intentfully you might not find that it's actually got that problem and chances are if you've got a giant dependency graph you're going to have bugs in there right that's just software um so that's 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 sort of been the premise behind uh, all of the research that, that, that we've done. And uh, I'm not going to show you who this is um, and who the module is. Uh, who here has changed their NPM password in the last, let's say, 90 days? None of you. <laughs> I did because I asked that question at another conference last week, and I hadn't done it either. And the reason is, is because when you npm log in, it sticks it in a configuration file, and you forget about it. And so, unless you, unless when you set your account up, and you picked a really good password at that time, it's still that shitty password that you set it up with. And so, we did a little brute force against um, against the registry, a um, little unsanctioned work, and just I'm not going to tell you what we did, but but let's just say weak passwords. And uh, so we found, we found users with weak passwords. And this is getting addressed by NPM um, to, try to try to improve that. Um, but let's say that like, we, found, we found one account. That's really shitty um, on purpose. So we found one maintainer. And this is this maintainer's dependency, dependency graph. They actually only have, I think it's, uh, it's like three or four modules that they publish. But then those three or four modules are dependent on 
by another level, right? And then those modules are dependent on, and for some projects, that goes very far. And that, imp that reach has, uh, has, has large impact, let's just say. So the security of your, your account and your code uh, actually matters for other people, um, which, is, which I think is kind of interesting. It was, it was very interesting to see uh, what impact those, uh, those had. Um, so that's that, uh, issue monitoring. So, uh, the last two things I have to talk about have to do with, um, basically, uh, so this one has to do with, uh, basic, uh, how can you improve the security, uh, of your project or your, the, the stuff you ship to production without actually touching any code? So this is this is like open source intelligent, right? How can we how can we pay attention to what's going on in the community? Uh, you know, one might be uh, keeping up with the Node Security Project, uh, you know, on Twitter and seeing what what vulnerabilities we publish, uh, or using RequireSafe and, and and getting those alerts. Uh, another way might be just pay attention. Um, I wrote a really this is this really horrible application that that just uh, that just scrapes all of the issues for anything that had a GitHub URL. Uh, any any project that had a GitHub URL it would scrape uh, issues every 24 hours. And it just kept track. And it would just, would, and it would just uh, full text index those and say, is there any keywords in those issues that might be security related? Put them in a queue, let a human look at them. Uh, and then we basically say yes or no, this is good or this is bad. And uh, uh, there's about five a day. And if I can keep up with the entire registry, chances are you can keep up with your projects and actually do that intentfully. Uh, and it actually has a great impact. We found uh, a vulnerability that was uh, that I didn't know about that was open for marked the markdown processor that's still unpatched and it was open uh, since last October uh, and just maintained there uh, a vulnerability in Se uh, SQLized SQL injection uh, and there's a bunch more that are unpatched that we're sort of trying to work with authors but they're out there they're public people know about them so you could you could potentially uh, maybe switch to a different library or something like that, or or uh, send a pull request to fix that, and uh, uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's it. I I find it really interesting. Um, it, basically, what we can do then is we can take the information that we found here and we can spread it to the community. Um, it sucks when security issues get get uh, submitted publicly. Um, but it happens, right? Somebody just says, this is a security issue, or maybe they don't know it's a security issue, it's just a bug, and so they drop it in, in, in GitHub issues, and then it's, it's there for all the world to see. But it impacts you because they're part of your dependency tree. Uh, and you might not even know that they're part of your dependency tree because you're using, let's say, four modules, but you have a dependency tree of 60 modules. And so it might, it might trickle down from there. Uh, so, so on, really understand what your dependency tree. The other thing I want to sort of um, uh, preach about, I guess, is if you fix a security problem in one of your modules, please uh, self-disclose. Please let the community know that there was an actual security flaw to motivate them to update their, uh, their module. And you can do so by uh, emailing a report at notesecurity.io or just going to notesecurity.io and, and letting us know. And that way we can publish an advisory and just it's, it'll be part of NSP and everyone will know about it. Their builds will break in their CI system and they can just update. Um, and the last thing is uh, uh, some Docker stuff I've been doing uh, over the last couple of weeks. So uh, anybody here heard of Rim, Rim Rafal, a module that was published besides you? Okay, so what's interesting is somebody in Lisbon, um, which I have yet to meet. I've been here and I'm like, I met, I met them. There's this big, there's a big situation. So anybody can publish any garbage on NPM, right? You can just be like, this module is an MP3 and you can just publish it. Um, and so somebody, and, and NPM modules have um, install hooks. So pre-install, post-install, um, post or pre-remove, stuff like that. But install hooks are very interesting because they're just you npm i and it runs that code before it installs the module. So if you say publish a module that is rm-rf slash star as a pre-install hook, it's going to fuck you over <laughs> if you do that. So they publish that and then they put it on Hacker News. And the description 
the description of the module said don't install this. That doesn't mean people aren't going to freaking install it. So, but it got me thinking. Like it's it, it is it is a problem. How how do you do that? There's one there's there's a dash dash ignore scripts I think it is that you can use when you install modules, which is great for CI systems so that somebody can't just jack your CI system. Um, it's but for a developer machine, like the first thing I'm going to do is if I can get if I so you know weak passwords plus patching code plus pre-install scripts plus owning a developer patching all of their modules publishing those modules it's going to spread right it's a, it's a, it's a problem with our ecosystem and so the problem is is we can't we can't police it and you can't stop people from writing or obfuscating code or um, uh, any of that stuff and, and putting it into our ecosystem. It's just, it's a part of the problem. It's, it's not unique to us. Uh, Pip has it, RubyGems has it, Perl has it, right? Um, it's just intentionally malicious. So I, I thought, how can we actually detect some of this? And I went back to my days at Symantec where we did sort of blended threat type uh, work where we had like a bunch of ghosted machines so we could reset the state and we could drop, uh, we could drop a, a blended threat like SQL Slammer or Blaster uh, in there and see, see how it spread, and, I, and, and we could see what it affected on the systems and how it how it changed them. Uh, it turns out Docker's really good uh, at helping at this problem, and it probably it's th this particular feature would probably be very useful to other things as well. And so what I did was I ran ran this particular module, and I'm actually currently running all of the modules in the registry, and it's probably pretty close to done uh, today, um, just to see what the baseline is for. Um, for uh, installed uh, for what they're doing to see if I could find any other bad actors in the, in the ecosystem. So I ran rim or fall um, in in Docker, and then Docker has this really cool feature, just Docker diff. You just run Docker diff, and it just craps out all of the changes. It just says here's all of the changes to the file system, adds, changes, and deletes. And if, you can immediately see, oh, we're deleting bin, home, lib, <laughs> etsy, root, right? Uh, and you immediately see that like this is this is an extremely bad actor. Now this is not perfect. This is back in the day. This is this is like this is like shitty antivirus detection, right? But it's better than what like we're now watching for this. Please don't publish stuff that's going to be like cause community havoc and whatever uh, intentionally just to see if we're going to catch it. Um, if you've got an idea, please just send it to us of, of of how you would evade detection of something like this, and maybe we can make it better. It is just antivirus esque, but it's better than what we had before. And so now we're kind of watching, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, that's basically it. If you didn't learn anything <coughs> from this presentation, please take some of the knowledge that you that you have that that's that's uh, that you that you already knew about and spread it to a couple of people. That's the greatest like. Uh, as well as if you learn new things, please please spread it to coworkers or friends that might benefit from this. Uh, it's the greatest thing that you can do for our community when it comes to security. So, thank you.